I'm a pediatric neurologist, and uh, I was asked to talk on congenital myasthenias. I've given this talk a few times before to pediatric, groups of pediatric neurologists, and <clears throat> usually just focused, again, on the congenital myasthenias, but these are pretty rare conditions even for us to see, and they're kind of confusing. And I know I'm speaking to a broader group, so I thought I'd expand it a bit to kind of shed light, and these are neuromuscular junction disorders, and I thought I'd cover myasthenic gravis a bit just in review to kind of refresh your knowledge about the neuromuscular junction and how it works as well as the, uh, the most common disease that affects it to kind of help you ease into the more esoteric uh, genetic forms of congenital myasthenia. <clears throat> So uh, the other thing that's helpful about that is that people can get uh, the nomenclature confused. Uh, the term myasthenia itself means muscle weakness. Um, and then these different names for these uh, groups of disorders can be confused easily. So we're dealing with uh, primarily the focus of this talk is on congenital myasthenia. These are a collection of rare, collectively rare genetic conditions that affect various aspects of the neuromuscular junction and its, its function. <clears throat> Uh, they usually present in infancy or in the neonatal period. Then the more common disorder, which we'll cover uh, in brief, myasthenia gravis is an acquired condition of autoimmune etiology uh, where antibodies affect the function of the neuromuscular junction uh, and lead to weakness uh, more often in, in later childhood or adulthood, as we'll see. And then there's a term neonatal myasthenia, and this is easily confused with the term congenital myasthenia, but it means something different. Uh, this is a unique situation where a mother has myasthenic gravis, the autoimmune disorder, either knowingly or, or an occult uh, form of that where she doesn't know she has the, the condition, but she passes the uh, pathologic antibodies to, uh, across the placenta to the child, and the child's born with some degree of weakness because the antibodies are in the system there. This is a transient condition as the child's not producing the antibodies once the antibodies pass. Uh, through the system, uh, they resolve, but still they're symptomatic and they require similar treatment as uh, myasthenia gravis <clears throat> and can be confusing and can be confused with congenital myasthenia. So it's helpful to kind of review these terms. Uh, as well, there's a lot of overlap between the way we diagnose uh, these disorders, their treatments, uh, and aspects of their pathophysiology. So I think it's helpful to kind of review the the neuromuscular junction disease that uh, most people are f at least have some uh, clinical familiarity with. So, so I'd also like to just go over basic neuromuscular junction anatomy and, and physiology. So uh, at the motor nerve, a nerve impulse comes down uh, to the, uh, the nerve terminal where there's acetylcholine in vesicles. This uh, nerve impulse leads to release of those vesicles, the, the contents being acetylcholine into the, into the synapse. Uh, this crosses the synapse and binds to the acetylcholine receptors on the postsynaptic muscle membrane. <clears throat> the binding leads to an opening of the uh, ion, central ion channel in the center of the receptor, which leads to current flow through the channel and leads to depolarization of the muscle. If the depolarization is enough uh, to, to uh, go over the, the threshold that leads to muscle contraction. Uh, and then the final part of it is uh, through a separate ion channel, there's repolarization to back to the resting potential. And all these are important steps. Uh, and in the congenital myasthenias, as we'll see, there's potential lesions, if you will, uh, at each step that can cause a disease. <clears throat> So just a schematic of the same thing, we can see at the top there, acetylcholine is formed from choline and acetylcholate uh, via this CHAT uh, enzyme, which is important in one of the uh, congenital myasthenias, and then it's uh, bound in vesicles, and when, the, when there's an electrical impulse down the motor neuron, it's released into the synapse, crosses the synapse uh, to the neuromuscular junction to the, um, rather, to the postsynaptic membrane to the acetylcholine receptor, which has multiple uh, associated proteins that are important, again, in the congenital myasthenias for its function. It's subsequently uh, uh, broken down by acetylcholine esterase, which is an important enzyme, both in uh, our understanding of the treatment of these uh, disorders, but as well one form of congenital myasthenia. And then this channel down there at the bottom of the, of the uh, picture there on the membrane is the repolarization channel. Uh, and that's important in one form of congenital myasthenia as well.
So just kind of given a real rough basic overview of myasthenia gravis, uh, it's a fairly common disorder, about 20 per 100,000 uh, patients. It's more common in adults, but about 20% of cases are pediatric and onset. Uh, they, behave, they can behave a little bit differently, as we'll see. Um, and pre-puberty uh, patients, um, it's thought to be an equal distribution between uh, male and female. Uh, but post-puberty, uh, there's an increased risk uh, for females to uh, develop the disorder. This is only, uh, the only caveat is in African-American populations, it's a constant female to male uh, predominance despite the age. <clears throat> so clinical features for myasthenia gravis. Uh, most patients present uh, with sudden onset of ptosis or diplopia, but they can develop facial bulbar weakness, uh, which can be involved in chewing and swallowing difficulties. And then oftentimes they progress to develop generalized uh, weakness with proximal greater than distal distribution. Uh, and typically weakness uh, worsens uh, towards the end of the day with repetitive uh, use and there can be rapid fluctuation. And about 15% of patients uh, have what's known as ocular myasthenia with involvement just of the eyelid and extraocular muscles. Uh, associated conditions, uh, so in pediatric myasthenia, there's about an 80% risk for having thymic hyperplasia or thymoma, and we'll see uh, the importance of that. This can be, hyperplasia and hypertrophy can be seen on CT or MRI of the chest. Uh, there's also an increased risk for thyroid disease, which kind of speaks to its autoimmune uh, etiology. So the basic pathophysiology, the antibodies uh, that are uh, uh, present uh, destroy the acetylcholine receptors at the neuromuscular junction. Uh, they lead to a reduction in the number of the receptors, but they can also directly block transmission uh, in the uh, receptors that are still present. And microscopically, we see a simplification of the postsynaptic membrane uh, with the folding pattern, uh, an increased gap between the axon and muscle membrane, and a decrease in receptor density. Um, so the diagnosis is primarily clinical. Um, <clears throat> there are uh, various uh, antibodies that are um, available for, for testing. These are less uh, s detectable, uh, less likely detectable in pediatric cases, particularly uh, in pre-puberty. Uh, so about half patients in one study uh, that were uh, pre-pubertal uh, had the presence of antibodies <clears throat> in, with generalized myasthenia. And then uh, peripuberty and post-puberty become much more sensitive uh, ocular myasthenia, they're uh, less often present, as well as with mild generalized myasthenia. Uh, electrodiagnostics um, <clears throat> are important in the diagnosis. Uh, repetitive nerve stimulation, uh, which is commonly done on the median nerve, uh, using three to five cycles per second, uh, is uh, a, a common test performed to, to support your clinical diagnosis. And if you get a reduction of more than 15% of the compound, compound muscle action potential, it's considered diagnostic. But uh, false negatives are not uncommon, particularly in ocular myasthenia, and it can be technically difficult in, in young kids uh, who don't tolerate this study very well. Uh, the Tensilon test, um, when it's done properly, uh, is uh, fairly useful, it can be positive up to 90% of cases. Um, you need to, before a test, you need to pick a, an objective kind of outcome, meaning uh, what are you gonna assess as the response clinically to, to this medication that you're given IV. So ptosis is a nice one, it's pretty easily observable uh, to de determine if there's a positive response. Um, <clears throat> with elimination being a positive response. And you should be uh, doing this with a, uh, a double, with a placebo, so a kind of a double-blinded placebo-controlled trial. As well, you want to give an initial test dose of the, of the medication, uh, which is periodostigmine, I'm sorry, um, and uh, this is in part uh, to make certain if you're dealing with a congenital myasthenia, you don't get some uh, terrible reaction. Um, and then this is followed by a full dose. You need to have atropine available in case there's uh, respiratory depression with this, which is a possibility. Um, and you should see a positive response if you're gonna see one within seconds to a few minutes. So to treatment with myasthenia gravis, um, 
Many patients require lifelong treatment. Uh, the caveat is that uh, it's not terribly uncommon for some children to have spontaneous remission during the first few years. Um, and the primary medication or anticholinesterase drugs. Uh, Pyrotostigmine is uh, the first line treatment in children uh, that don't have respiratory compromise. And you want to start with a low dose to make certain it's tolerated and uh, slow titration upwards. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that pushing doses too far can sometimes uh, make patients weaker, um, but starting low would also uh, make you aware of the, their response to the, colon uh, the cholinergic side effects. And these include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal cramping, lacrimation, and increased respiratory secretions. Uh, and the effect usually begins about a half hour after ingestion and peaks in uh, one to two hours and lasts about uh, four to six hours. Uh, as this is an autoimmune condition, immunosuppressant treatments are also considered uh, when you're not getting a full response to the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, pregnisone is often used uh, when, when you're not getting that. Uh, this can also induce weakness, so you need to be aware, particularly in patients that are moderately or severely impaired already, uh, can lead to a steroid myopathy. So if you have a patient who's uh, pretty compromised, you, wanna, uh, you might want to admit them to the hospital to monitor the administration. And improvement uh, takes a while. It usually won't be apparent for a few weeks. Uh, daily steroid treatment for more than six months, as you can imagine, leads to a lot of side effects. And in children, we're particularly concerned about their growth. So there's evidence that alternative day uh, therapy with steroids is uh, less adverse on their uh, growth. Other immunosuppressants, azathioprine, can be used in refractory cases. Uh, the onset of effects, not for several months. You need to monitor white so, uh, blood cell counts. There's a risk for, as a carcinogen, if, with prolonged use, and there's a low teratogenic effect. As well, cyclosporin can be used. It's thought to be equally as effective as azathioprine, but has a more rapid onset. And you need to monitor renal function with this medication. <coughs> IBIG can be used, particularly in the acute setting. Uh, most of the trial data comes from adults, uh, but the response rate is uh, high, uh, though uh, short-lived with an average uh, half-life of about 30 days uh, effect. And then plasma exchange is another uh, acute type of treatment. Uh, it gives much more rapid improvement, it lasts between three and five weeks. Uh, and something you consider in a hospitalized patient, uh, maybe ones that are awaiting thymectomy during an acute attack. So as I mentioned, it's an autoimmune disorder and the thymus plays an important role. Uh, there's evidence that myeloid cells uh, within the thymus uh, have a display of acetylcholine receptors themselves, and this may serve as uh, the antigenic stimulus from the disease, it's not entirely clear. Uh, the thymus, thymus also contains uh, autoreactive T cells. Um, in the uh, thymus, hyperplastic thymus taken from myasthenic patients at surgery can produce uh, the antibodies in vitro. And whether one or more of these factors is uh, the, the thing that initiates the disease or sustains the disease is not entirely understood. But uh, thymectomy is an important consideration, particularly in younger patients. Uh, it's well accepted treatment for, for young patients, pediatric patients with autoimmune myasthenia. And this is despite uh, really good uh, data um, uh, or definite explanation for its effectiveness. Uh, there was one match retrospective study which found an increased remission of myasthenic uh, symptoms following thymectomy. And there's several unmatched uh, studies that have reported similar outcomes. And it appears that the sooner you do the thymectomy, uh, the more uh, effective it is. So the recommendation is uh, to, to, for it to be done in the, within a year after the onset of symptoms. And results appear to be proportional to the amount of thymus that's removed. Uh, so symptoms are, uh, the more you take out, the uh, bigger improvement in symptoms you see. So that covers the autoimmune myasthenia gravis, just kind of as a refresher for neuromuscular junction disease. So we'll talk about the congenital myasthenias. Uh, again, these are genetic conditions and fairly rare, uh, even for pediatric neurologists, so we think of these as sort of white whales. Um, <clears throat> so their genetic disorders affect the neuromuscular junction. Uh, they all share fatigable weakness as a clinical uh, characteristic, but uh, discrete syndromes have uh, their own unique phenotype. We'll try to talk about that and things that you can uh, use to pick out individual uh, 
uh, syndromes. I originally uh, put this part of this talk together at least about two years ago, and back then uh, there were 16 genes identified. Now there's 24 genes implicated uh, thus far in, in congenital myasthenic syndromes. Uh, most of these are present at birth or early infancy, although there's subtypes that present in childhood and even into adulthood. So these are rare, they're likely underdiagnosed. Uh, the prevalence of genetically confirmed disease is about four per million, and they're largely recessive. There's, uh, there are uh, dominant disorders, but the vast majority of these are recessive. So you don't necessarily expect to, to hear a family history to support the, the diagnosis unless it's a sibling, potentially. Uh, pathophysiology. <clears throat> So there's kind of four areas that can be affected, uh, and the first one is mutations that affect signal transmission. This is primarily the production of acetylcholine. Uh, and then you can have mutations in the gene encoding for key proteins in the development or the function of the receptor, the acetylcholine receptor. That's the biggest group, uh, and they make up the biggest number or biggest percentage of patients. You can have mutations in the acetylcholine esterase, the enzyme, um, so where you get faulty breakdown of acetylcholine at the receptor, which leads to weakness. And then you can have mutations in the, uh, the channel that's involved in repolarization of the muscle membrane, that's after contraction, to get back to your, your resting uh, potential, that, that uh, channel's not working in this form of congenital myasthenia. So the same schematic we looked at before, just to kind of go back over. So there's kind of four areas you can have lesions, if you will. So the production of the, of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, and that's primarily due to this CHAT enzyme that's involved in the uh, formation of the, the chemical acetylcholine. Uh, you can have uh, a problem at the receptor or its associated proteins, and there's a, a, the, the majority of mutations are involving this, uh, this part of the, of the um, system. Uh, and then you can have acetylcholine esterase uh, mutation, so problems breaking down acetylcholine. And then the number four is the repolarization uh, mechanism can be affected. So this is a, a little bit old and gives you an idea of some of the genes currently and uh, their main pathology and broken down into the, the four kind of groups of dysfunction. And this is uh, an idea, this is probably uh, a little dated <clears throat> at this point, uh, but three of the uh, genes identified, and these are all postsynaptic uh, support, uh, mem uh, support proteins for the receptor or the receptor itself make up the vast majority of these cases. That's the acetylcholine receptor, epsilon subunit, rapsin, and DOC7. So those really are the most important to have some clinical knowledge of, but uh, there's a lot, a lot of uh, other ones that make up the, the rest. So, uh, so individual syndromes of uh, congenital myasthenia, uh, myasthenia and diagnostic clues. We'll go from uh, kind of the, the first lesion to the fourth lesion and talk about the, the most common uh, mutations and how they present. So presynaptically, uh, there's a choline uh, acetyl transferase deficiency, that's the CHAT uh, enzyme. Uh, these patients present with sudden episodes of respiratory distress, apnea, bulbar weakness, and this is often precipitate, precipitated by infection. Uh, they're relatively strong in between uh, these crises. Uh, it's apparent from birth uh, and continues episodically. Uh, and these patients can be normal at birth and then develop apneas later as well. Uh, ptosis is typical, but ophthalmoplegia is, is absent in this condition. And if we go to the synapse, I'm doing this a bit out of the order I, I numbered them on the schematic, but uh, if we go to acetylcholine esterase deficiency, or the, uh, the gene is called ColQ, uh, this leads to loss of acetylcholine esterase, the uh, enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine at this synapse. This leads to a prolonged lifetime of acetylcholine and its uh, activation, which leads to depolarization and blockade detectable on EMG. So this is a lot like giving succinylcholine, uh, if you will, uh, eventually uh, you overexcite the muscle as well, besides causing uh, weakness acutely, this prolonged uh, excitation because of prolonged stimulation of the, of the receptor leads to an, a secondary excitotoxic myopathy. This is not the only uh, 
one of these uh, mutations that leads to this type of a secondary uh, progressive myopathy, and we'll see that. These patients present with severe and progressive weakness from birth or early infancy, uh, and respiratory involvement is common with respiratory crises and or chronic hypoventilation. Ophthalmoplegia and ptosis are common, but uh, they're variably present. And treatment is with oral salbutamol or ephedrine, and uh, these patients can worsen with parotostigmine, and this can be severe. Um, postsynaptically, again, uh, these are the, the mutations that affect the function of the receptor um, and make up the vast majority of cases. Uh, and I'll just cover three of them, the acetylcholine receptor, uh, mutation involving the epsilon uh, subunit, rapsin and DOC7. So the acetylcholine receptor deficiency is the uh, most common form of congenital myasthenia. Uh, most patients present with feeding problems, ptosis at birth or infancy. The epsilon subunit, which is affected, replaces the fetal gamma subunit of the acetylcholine receptor during late gestation. Um, and, but there's continued lifelong low-level fetal receptor type uh, production, and this accounts for why these patients still survive, because they still have some of the uh, gamma subunit functioning. Ophthalmoplegia is uh, invariably present uh, and severe, but usually develops within the first year, and it's not present at birth. Um, and usually it's a, a stable uh, long-term course, but it can worsen intermittently with illness. It responds well to purotostigmine, the main treatment for, as we saw, myasthenia gravis, uh, with or without uh, the addition of a drug called 3,4-DAP. Rapsin mutation. Um, so rapsin is a, a, a protein that helps the clustering of the acetylcholine receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. These patients present with neonatal respiratory weakness, feeding difficulty, generalized hypotonia, and mild arthrogryposis. They can have a, a facial dysmorphism of a high arch palate due to akinesia. That's not terribly specific to, uh, to this. It's uh, often seen in, in neuromuscular diseases that are congenital. Um, they can have, uh, they tend to have generalized weakness, ptosis, and strabismus, but rarely have ophthalmoplegia. Uh, they have frequent acute life-threatening uh, crises with respiratory failure in infancy and early childhood with infection. And they also respond well to pyrotostigmine and 3,4-DAP. The long-term prognosis is good with decreasing respiratory events during childhood and resolving around the age of seven years. Uh, and many of the adult patients can uh, reduce or stop treatment. So that's a bit unique about that condition. Um, the DOC7 is the third postsynaptic uh, protein I was going to cover. Uh, it presents with deterioration in walking after reaching normal milestones, so a bit different than some of these other ones with a later presentation, and can pre but can present earlier with uh, restro weakness, feeding difficulties, and strider in infancy. Um, the weakness is uh, generally in a limb girdle distribution with facial muscles affected, leading to what's called a myasthenic snarl. Uh, ptosis, uh, but not uh, ophthalmoplegia and tongue wasting are, are noted, so you don't get the ophthalmoplegia. Um, and it's slowly progressive, it's possibly again due to a secondary myopathy. My, a muscle biopsy in that regard shows mild nonspecific changes. Pyrotostigmine uh, will typically worsen symptoms and it needs to be avoided. 3, 4 DAP can help, but uh, some patients show a significant deterioration with this, so it's a bit tricky. Uh, and, but they do respond to the oral salbutamol or ephedrine. Kinetic defects, this is another uh, receptor abnormality, a little bit different, um, called the slow channel syndrome. I only include this because this is the only uh, dominantly inherited congenital myasthenic syndrome. Uh, the age of onset is uh, widely variable between birth and the fourth and fifth decade. Most patients present in childhood, though, with neck flexion, weakness, and difficulty running. Uh, the underlying pathology is uh, prolonged acetylcholine receptor opening uh, and a, a subsequent desensitization blockade of the receptor. So because the receptor remains open and active, you get an excitotoxic end plate myopathy with loss, eventual loss of structural integrity uh, and uh, clinical deterioration. Pyrotostigmine and 3,4-DAP exacerbates the, the underlying pathology, as you can imagine. The problem is that the, the channel is working too well. So treatment is with uh, fluoxetine or uh, quinidine, uh, since these act to uh, block open channels. <laughs> 
And then the fast channel syndrome, uh, this is uh, the, uh, the, one of the uh, mutations that affects the repolarization of the muscle membrane. And it's the most severe form of congenital myasthenia. Uh, and uh, it's associated with life-threatening acute crises on a background of severe generalized weakness. Uh, it presents from birth with respiratory failure, feeding difficulties, generalized hypotonium. Ptosis and ophthalmoplegia are invariable and severe. Feeding difficulties, difficulties persist into childhood, and necessitating a PEG placement for feeding. Uh, and they have episodic apneas, chronic hypoventilation, and require non-invasive ventilation at home. Uh, Pyrotostigmine in 3,4-DAP can help, but this can uh, wear off after initial striking re response. Uh, so neurophysiology, the neurodiagnostics for these conditions, um, they're similar to myasthenia gravis. Uh, you can have what's called increased jitter if you can get someone to do a single fiber EMG, uh, but it can be normal in unaffected muscles. Uh, and again, repetitive nerve stimulation shows a decrement of the compound motor uh, action potential in these cases. Um, <clears throat> single fiber EMG is more sensitive, but less specific than repetitive nerve stimulation. Uh, the big issue is finding someone who's good at this and you know, available, uh, you know, so a pediatric neuromuscular person, uh, and they're uh, not often uh, around. So it's great if you can get it, but oftentimes that's kind of the bottleneck in the, in the diagnosis. And the differential diagnosis is uh, rather large, so it includes autoimmune myasthenia, and then depending on the scenario, you know, in a neonate, that would be the neonatal myasthenia, and you know, you'd investigate with uh, antibodies and uh, electrodiagnosis, as well as mom's history, if, if she has a diagnosed myasthenia, it's pretty straightforward. Congenital myopathy, mitochondrial disease leading to a metabolic myopathy, Congenital cranial disinnervation disorders or acquired cranial nerve palsies, usually in the neonate. You can have congenital fibrosis of the extraocular muscles, which leads to ophthalmoplegia. Spinal muscular atrophy, so an anterior horn cell disease. prader willi syndrome, which is a uh, genetic syndrome which presents with uh, hypotonium feeding dysfunction. Uh, and congenital myotonic dystrophy, which also leads to a similar picture of hypotonia and feeding dysfunction. So it's rather broad and not really inclusive of, of all the other things you might consider uh, in the differential diagnosis. And you know, if you put congenital myasthenia on the list and, and compare the, the prevalence, it would be the, the least common probably of all those things. So it's, it's really something we, we think about uh, but rarely diagnose and have difficulty kind of investigating uh, until recently. Um, <clears throat> so the, the general consult for us and picture that we see is rather vague. We get a consult most often from the NICU about a neonate with hypotonia, respiratory, and bulbar problems. Uh, again, if we look back at that, a differential diagnosis is quite long. Um, and so, you know, only one of the things is congenital myasthenia. It's often uh, a process of elimination, uh, particularly if you're relying on EMG uh, that's not readily available. Uh, it's just something that you consider and oftentimes don't even broach the subject. But so these symptoms are fairly common in the NICU and nonspecific hypotonia, respiratory bulbar symptoms uh, and uh, making matters a little more difficult. Assessing muscle strength at times is difficult and um, the neurophysiologic studies are the best way to determine whether this is even a neuromuscular junction problem, which is often not available. Um, <clears throat> but features that might uh, tip you off that you're dealing with congenital myasthenia um, in a neonate or infant. So generalized hypotonia, kind of nonspecific ptosis, a little bit more uh, to pique your interest in that, ophthalmoplegia, recurrent apneas, uh, hypoventilation, and feeding difficulties. Less common, but kind of more pointed to specific syndromes, uh, bulbar weakness, progressive, progressive generalized weakness. So. The disorders that have a secondary myopathy are often progressive. Strider uh, is seen in the, the DOC7 mutation. Dysmorphic features, as I said, it's not terribly specific, but might make you think of rapsin. Arthrogryposis as well for rapsin.
Uh, and then features to consider in older patients, so outside the NICU, you know, in first decade or even older. Um, so if you have a patient with a, a chronic neuromuscular disorder of unknown etiology, uh, and they have this kind of a secondary uh, progressive uh, course, if you will, with a, with a myopathy, uh, with neurophysiology that suggests neuromuscular junction. You can think of the slow channel the cold Q, Q mutations. A limb girdle presentation, myasthenic snarl, uh, particularly with tongue wasting would make you think of DOC7. Neck flexion weakness in a young child, the slow channel mutation. Problems running, again, slow channel mutation. The development of ophthalmoplegia should make you think of one of these. There's a, you know, certainly a, a list of other uh, disorders to consider in that situation as well. Uh, continuation or resolution even of the apneic events uh, with infection for a lot of these, but the resolution uh, over the first decade would make you think of rapsin mutation. Um, and that's just kind of a, a similar kind of thing to identify the unique phenotypic expressions of these different uh, genes. So work up for that same patient with the hypotonia, bulbar dysfunction, and respiratory problems would be broad um, CK, metabolic workup, MRI, brain and spine. Uh, brain disease is the most common cause of hypotonia in a neonate. Uh, acetylcholine receptor antibodies to look for a neonatal vertical transmission uh, of maternal disease. Uh, spinal muscular atrophy, uh, prader willi and congenital myotonic dystrophy genetic testing. And then if you have the uh, capability to get an EMG nerve conduction with repetitive nerve stimulation, single fiber EMG, just to identify that it is a neuromuscular junction disorder, it would be great. Uh, Tensilon testing as well in a controlled setting is useful. And then genetic workup. Uh, when I trained, this wasn't even a consideration, the genetic workup, it was getting um, a muscle biopsy, fresh tissue, and it's sent to a lab, and they can do electrodiagnostics and, and um, immunostain to look for specific uh, protein abnormalities. Uh, in three years of fellowship, we never did that, uh, and I, I can't recall ever actually even getting uh, a nerve conduction study to, to investigate this uh, as best I remember. But. Uh, so it's become much more feasible. Now I just reviewed um, the availability of these tests, and there's gene chips that uh, cover 16 of the, of the uh, known genes, uh, relatively uh, cheap uh, and straightforward uh, assessment of the common mutations. So uh, that's really changing this whole diagnostic conundrum. Uh, but you still have to kind of whittle down to, to, to the point that you think it's a neuromuscular disease. Uh, and this is just an updated list uh, from uh, gene reviews of the um, current uh, known uh, genes that are involved in the incidence uh, and how they're uh, diagnosed genetically. These are the most common here, and then there's the rest of the list. So quite a few that make up less than 1% of this rare condition that have been identified, and most of these recently. Uh, treatment, uh, again, there's some overlap, at least in some cases, uh, uh, with uh, myasthenia. So cholinesterase inhibitors and 3,4-DAP are used in a lot of these conditions. These increase end plate potential amplitude. The cholinesterase inhibitors, they prolong the lifetime of the acetylcholine at the end plate, so increase the likelihood of, uh, of uh, muscle contraction, depolarization. And the 3,4-DAP, which I didn't mention its function before, but it works presynaptically at the potassium channels uh, as a blocker. And this leads to increased release of acetylcholine at the synaptic cleft. Uh, the two drugs are often used together uh, and is used in slow channel uh, syndrome, col Q, DOC7. I'm sorry, the, uh, these are the ones that those can, can worsen rather, um, but used in a lot of the conditions as I mentioned before. Uh, and then ephedrine and oral salbutamol, uh, these uh, stimulate muscle uh, beta receptors, which leads to stabilization of the postsynaptic architecture. And these are uh, used in DOC7 and COL-Q. Uh, the response can be dramatic, um, even when it started later in, in childhood or adulthood. Uh, and then some of the other subtypes uh, have shown to found some benefit with these. And then lastly, uh, fluoxetine quinidine in slow channel syndrome. So 
the primary pathogenic mechanism is an abnormally prolonged opening of the central ion uh, channel port in the receptor. And both of these um, block uh, open channels uh, and bind the channel in its open state, therefore uh, reducing the channel activity uh, in open time. <laughs>